What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the end of the year madness. And today we are going to be ranking every new horror film that I saw in 2023. Speaking of horror stories, yeah, I had a little disagreement, a little misunderstanding with my beard trimmer this morning. So you get vintage Cody for at least a couple of weeks, but I'll get through it. Thank you for all your, your messages of love and support during this trying time. I'm ugly and I'm proud. But yep, just like last year, of course, with the typical worst of the year list, best of the year, most surprising, all that goodness, I did a ranking of all of the horror films, and I think there was like 26 movies, something like that last year. We got 46 this year. God damn! Now it needs to be said, this is my own personal ranking. This is based off of my taste, my preference, which movies I would rewatch the most, which ones I enjoyed the most. Obviously, my list is not going to look like your list. Post yours down below, all the new horror films that you saw this past year, from worst to best, and uh, we'll discuss that down in the comment section. Civilly, remember? Civilly. Coming at number 46, the worst film that I saw in 2023, not just horror film, and that's Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. I'm not going to waste any more of my time or energy discussing this film, the multitude of issues with it, my attitude towards it, and now this universe of bullshit that's going to be coming out over the next couple of years because of the success of this film. Nor do I want to talk anymore about how ridiculous and, and soft the filmmakers who created it are. Go look at my worst of the year list uh, from just a couple of days ago. You can hear all of that on there. But 46, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Here's a nice piece of shit. Number 45, Natty Knox, a little independent horror film that was getting advertised quite a bit on the horror alumni casting that it had. Yeah, Daniel Harris, Robert Anglin, Bill Mosley. It was also directed by the director of Halloween 4. So got quite a few slasher fans excited. I finally checked it out. I thought the movie was absolutely dreadful. The four people that are here, or the three people that are here that are horror alumni uh, do fairly well with their performances. Everybody else does not. The story is like two or three jumbled ideas together that don't really feel like they have much of a connective tissue, just an exercise in very bad horror filmmaking. So unfortunately, that one's 45. 44 is going to be Skinamarink, a movie that I admire the concept. I admire what the director was trying to do. I am curious to see what this person does in the future, but this was an absolutely miserable viewing experience. This was an interesting idea and a concept for a little horror short that could have been cool exploring the the dreamlike horror uh, of a child's nightmare. But stretched out to an hour and 40 minutes, it was absolutely, in every sense of the word, an endurance test, and I hated it. Coming in at 43 is going to be a horror comedy called Don't Suck. This stars Jamie Kennedy and Matt Reif. I believe this might be Matt Reif's first foray into acting i could be wrong it's the first time i've seen him do a movie i was really hoping for this one because i'm a big fan of mostly everybody involved and the only effective humor that i get nowadays is from stand-up comics so i was hoping some of that would bleed into this movie this was unbearably unfunny i honestly don't know how so many genuinely funny people are involved with this to have a movie with less than zero laughs uh, i wish that I could have left this on off of this list and put it on the most surprising list as, as a comedy for everybody to put their eyes on and to, to check out and to support, but nope. Number 42 is going to be Children of the Corn, the latest attempt to reboot and revitalize this disastrous franchise. I've only seen four of these films, and when I saw this one, I said, this has to be the worst Children of the Corn film. Then I watched all of the other ones, and this is like a top three Children of the Corn film, which tells you how terrible this franchise is uh, the lead villainous kid does a decent enough job, but still pales in comparison to the original characters, the original film, the lead protagonist girl. I didn't feel was very convincing. The horror, the slasher, the kill side of the movie wasn't very interesting or effective. And whatever they decided to give us as far as the visualization of he who walks behind the rose. No, thanks. 41 is fear, a pretty typical setup. You get a group of people together in an isolated situation and fear starts to take over their mind. Paranoia starts to take over their mind. So they're starting to see a bunch of apparitions and they're starting to hallucinate. And one by one, they all start to befall these terrible fates. Very generic movie with characters that to me made no sense to be together. There was no like chemistry within the cast. Anything that the movie was trying to do on the horror side of things we have seen done dozens of times before. Just an absolute mess and absolutely forgettable. By the time I got to my truck in the parking lot, forgot everything about this movie. Number 40 is Nefarious, a movie that I walked into absolutely blind, thought it was just a kind of run of the mill possession movie, prison movie with uh, Sean Patrick Flannery. Little did I know this is actually kind of like a Christian 
propaganda type movie that was made by the people that made God's Not Dead and Unplanned. So there's a little bit more going on for this movie as far as filmmaking than those two movies I just named. But this, at the end of the day, feels like you're sitting down and being shouted at through a megaphone as somebody goes through their checklist of political points that they want to tell you about. If you feel like being lectured for 90 minutes on abortion and euthanasia and the death penalty and how modern society has befallen to Satan's evil, then by all means, check this out. No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. Number 39, The Exorcist Believer, uh, an exercise in trying to milk a recognizable IP and not putting anything worthwhile into it. This is the same creative team that brought us the recent Halloween reboot trilogy, which was a mixed execution at best, in my opinion. This was not a movie that I ever really had much faith in, no pun intended, but when I actually saw the end product, I was actually pretty shocked at uh, the just bafflingly bad decisions that they made here at its best it's a decently produced, slick production of a very generic exorcism movie of which we have had dozens and dozens of those since the original Exorcist, and this brings absolutely nothing new to the table. If you sift a little bit through that for more things to get frustrated for, you have weird out-of-place agendas put into the dialogue that make no sense within the context of the film and actually disrespect the legacy of the original film. You have your legacy character here that is completely wasted and disrespected as well. And even in the third act, the movie makes a very baffling decision to kind of sideline Christianity and the Catholic Church, who are very much a prevalent piece of the exorcism movies, in order to prop up community love and community uh, religions and, you know, high five kumbaya powers to take out the evil demon. Gigantic miss. Number 38 is A Creature Was Stirring, a movie that came out in December, right in time for the Christmas season, and a movie that I admired its ambition. It has a lot of bold ideas that it's trying to explore, both in just the surface level horror with creature feature stuff, but also a bit of commentary and a bit of a uh, extra things to discuss underneath the surface that are going to kind of come out by the end of the film. I was always interested in seeing where this story ultimately was going to go. Unfortunately, the thing is absolutely crippled by the low budget of the film, and what they're able to do is just, it's absolutely stifled by the amount of money that they had to work with. And ultimately, by the end of the story, I felt like there was a bit too bold of an idea that they were trying to do that uh, when the things are ultimately revealed in the last five to ten minutes, I actually think it dismantles quite a bit about what worked in the earlier acts of the film. Number 37 is The Nun 2. I am not a fan of The Nun whatsoever. In fact, I think that's my least favorite in the Conjuring universe, so I had no hope for this one. But when a lot of people told me that this is significantly better than the first film, started to get a little more intrigued. And I don't know what movie those people saw. Maybe this is better in certain aspects than the first, but that's extremely low bar, but certainly not better enough to to really merit discussing that or, or to bring that up as a selling point. It's still a pretty generic and terrible and, and lifeless movie to me. I don't find Valak to be a character that's very interesting on its own. I don't think that it's all that effective on its own. You know, Valak was very creepy and interesting within The Conjuring 2. Both of these Nun movies have failed to use The Nun in a way that would actually make it merit its own little mini franchise. I don't think that the characters that are both new and continuing from the first film have a whole lot interesting going on. And at the end of the day, it's just another one of those kind of generically produced studio conjuring style movies where they see what James Wan did. They get somebody who's not nearly as talented trying to replicate some of that, and it just doesn't work. Coming at number 36, it's a wonderful knife. And I actually had a lot of hope for this one because this is the latest in the, the little subgenre, if you will, of taking a classic movie and putting a slasher spin on it. So we had Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You, which is taken like the Groundhog Day mixed with a slasher. We had Freaky, which was Freaky Friday mixed with a slasher earlier on this year and much higher on this list. You had Totally Killer, which was Back to the Future plus slasher. And this one, obviously, with It's a Wonderful Knife being the title is It's a Wonderful Life plus slasher. So I was really interested in seeing what they were going to do here, having the concept of somebody that kind of wants to die and wishes they were never born and then seeing an alternate reality where that's actually the truth and how that negatively affects everybody in their life, but also having a killer kind of going on in the background. But that potential is squandered pretty much throughout the entire film. The only person who is doing anything interesting with their performance is Justin Long, who is revealed extremely early on as the killer. So you completely remove 
any bit of the mystery or a whodunit aspect here. But his performance doesn't fit the movie that they're making. I would rather see the movie that Justin Long thinks that he's in, but he feels completely out of place within everything else going on in the film. The main character and the story that we are, are going on with her about her existential crisis and what causes her to feel like she would be or the world would be better off without her. It's never set up properly. It's never followed through properly. You never really get a complete picture of what exactly they're trying to explore here. Ultimately, it just seems like it goes in a direction of just being a bit of a coming out story, and that's fine, but it feels more tacked on than it feels like the actual point of the movie by the time you start exploring that. And, you know, the kills, they're okay, they're bloody, but nothing to write home about. And then there's plenty of things in the movie that just completely strain credibility and are like really annoying, bad horror writing tropes where you have people making extremely stupid decisions people doing things that normal people would never do in these scenarios, having things where the killer falls over unconscious and rather than just stomping this person to death or grabbing the knife that's three inches away and just ending this scenario, they, they like creep around the killer. Let's not wake them up. And it's just infuriating. Those scenarios were annoying and outplayed in the eighties. It's 2023. Time to stop. Number 35 is a film that I saw at Fantastic Fest, and a number of these are going to be films that I saw at Fantastic Fest that have not actually released wide yet, but are, in fact, 2023 releases. You'll Never Find Me. This was my least favorite film at Fantastic Fest, just because the time in, in, the, in the festival that I saw it, I was already pretty exhausted. My patience was already starting to wear thin on these slow movies. And this one was extremely slow burn. And it's one of those films where I saw what they were going for pretty early on. And so I was very impatient and kind of unwilling to go on this long journey to get to a point that I had already arrived at. You have this guy who's very creepy in his like double wide trailer. It's a really bad storm outside. This young girl comes to his door looking for shelter. And they're essentially both locked in this trailer and both of them suspects the other one has nefarious motives. And so it's just two people having a conversation over and over again. And the movie keeps trying to shift your attention from one character to the other and wondering which one has something weird going on, which one, if any of them, has ulterior motives. And, you know, I would just say the performances were good at that for the first chunk of the movie. After a while, to me, it started to just feel a bit too fantastical. Like, people don't talk that moody and that brooding in normal conversations. And so it felt like the movie was almost over-manipulative with the dialogue and with the performances of always trying to direct your eyes towards somebody in a suspicious manner when they just, people don't talk that way. So... It was fine. It was well made. The The amount of effects they're able to bring in here and kind of creating this nightmarish, almost fantastical visualizations of certain things as things get weirder throughout the film. But by the end of it, it just felt like the end note that we got to was not worth that slow burn journey. Number 34 is VHS 85. I have seen three of the VHS films at this point. The original one, the VHS was at 94, whatever was at Fantastic Fest last year and then VHS 85. And honestly, none of the VHS movies have done very much for me. There's individual little shorts that I have liked, but every single one of them, the ones that I liked are the the smaller side of the experience, whereas ones that I could take or leave or didn't like tend to fill out more of the film. And that was absolutely the case with this one. This is my least favorite of the VHSs that I've seen so far. Uh, I did like one of the shorts in regards to a group of people that are being attacked on this lake and then they find out that they're like undead. But as soon as that short started to get interesting, it literally just stops and cuts off. It picks up later on in the movie in kind of a, a, a different perspective sort of way. But to me, the time that it picked up wasn't near as interesting as the story that they were setting up in the beginning. There was an interesting short that was done by Scott Derrickson and written by C. Robert Cargill, who are the writing and directing partners for Sinister and the Black Phone and the first Doctor Strange. And I liked what they were going for, but it felt way too big for the VHS concept. It almost felt like the VHS concept was forced into this when this was a good enough concept for them to just do a, a regular movie. So it didn't quite work for me. So this one... By the time that I watched it uh, midnight on like day three or day four of this festival, 
it was just not a very good viewing experience. And there's certain points of the movie that it grated on my nerves so bad that I just wanted to leave. Number 33 is another Fantastic Fest film called Out of Darkness. When I saw it, it was titled The Origin, but it's been retitled and it's got a release date, I think in like February or March. And this is essentially a movie where uh, it's very similar to Prey from last year, the the Predator sidequel. I don't want to call it a sequel, but a prequel, whatever. The, the Predator film Prey, if you took the Predator out of it, took all the action sequences out of it, set it in prehistoric times, and the thing that is hunting them is just something in the dark. So you have this, you know, in group of cavemen people, basically, that are trying to get from point A to point B, and in the dark, something keeps stalking them and taking them one by one. Started off really interesting, started off very tense. Uh, I, I thought it was very creatively done. They create their own language to have these people speak. So it's all in subtitles uh, and exploring a little bit of the lack of humanity in very early groups of people when it's just about survival was a little interesting too. eventually where the movie goes. Once things start to become revealed, it was so grounded that I found it to be disappointing. Like it makes sense. I understand thematically what they were going for, but to me, everything that I was picturing was maybe in that darkness was a more interesting answer than the one that they gave us. Number 32 is Bo is Afraid. And, you know, this one, you know, again, I'm putting a lot of horror adjacent movies on this list. This is kind of like horror, fantasy, comedy, drama, all kind of mixed into one. But there's certainly some horrific images and things explored here. I didn't care for this movie at all. You know, this is something that you either love or hate. And I, I, fell very close to the hate side of things. You know, Joaquin Phoenix does everything he he can. You know, he's a great performer no matter what you give him. There is a lot of creativity at play. Like I can admire some of the filmmaking itself, but the story that they're telling doesn't interest me. It's weird, it's wacky. I don't understand exactly like the appeal here and a 3-hour version of it especially was just way 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 too much. One of the endurance test movies of the year. And so the end of it I, I just kind of felt like it was this very self-indulgent experiment by Ari Aster. And so he is now two of his three films I have not cared for. And I dislike this movie on a level and dislike this experience on a level where I, I genuinely wonder if I'm going to give Ari Aster movies a chance in the future unless I see people that I trust that have similar tastes to me recommending them because I didn't care for Midsummer at all, and I really didn't care for this. And so it just seems like this guy, the, the movies that he makes are just, they're not for me. 31, The Pope's Exorcist. Pretty generic movie that only has somewhat of a standout appeal to it because Russell Crowe is playing the, the Pope's Exorcist and his goofy performance kind of makes this a little bit unique. This still falls victim to all of the other exorcism movies that we have gotten over the last number of years that just kind of go for the same visuals, the same story beats, the same attempts at scares. And I really don't care too much for that subgenre whatsoever. Very few of them stand out to me. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't enjoy moments of this because of Russell Crowe. You know, if you've seen exorcist movies and you feel like they're all a dime a dozen, this one's also a dime a dozen, but a, a tiny little nugget of something interesting to watch it for there. Number 30 is The Boogeyman. This is something that was based off of, I believe, a Stephen King short story. I, I thought this was maybe tied to the Boogeyman franchise from like the early 2000s, but it's not. It's a totally different thing. You have a monster that comes in the dark. Uh, very simple concept. We've seen versions of that before. It's okay. There's some decent scares. There's some decent uh, ways that they use lighting. Like the little girl has this little fluorescent globe and sometimes she'll roll it down a hallway and like the the light will emanate from it and so you kind of go down this dark hallway of nothingness and slowly things start to come into view there's moments uh, of, of good horror filmmaking there with with the use of lighting but story-wise character decision-wise it's a very frustrating movie the logic just completely goes out the window for me in this one where you have a monster where its weakness is light and nobody turns a fucking light on at any point in this movie, like the little girl knows this monster exists. She's fucking terrified. She's scared to death. And there's a point in the movie where she just goes down into the dark basement to play PlayStation and doesn't have any lights on. And she's sitting there and it's like, oh, oh, shit, he's here. And the only light that's saving her is the, the, the glow from the TV moments like that, where it's just like. No, 
<laughs> Nobody would do that. And even things in the third act where characters are finally starting to take the fight to the monster and they don't bring like a whole shitload of flashlights with them. It's just, it, it totally strains creative. <laughs> Dumb shit's making my brain short circuit. It totally strained credibility to a point where I lacked enjoyment in those sequences because the logic just did not add up. 29, there's something in the barn. I think this movie would have been significantly higher if I had seen it earlier on in the festival. This is also a fantastic fest movie, but I saw it after the festival. I saw it after spending nine days at this festival in Texas, flew home and then watched it that day later on on Fat Fantastic Fest at home, the little app. And uh, my daughter really enjoyed this. It's got a lot of things in common with Gremlins where there's these, it, it's in the... Norwegian mountains you have these people that go into this house and they're staying there and there's these Norwegian elves that live out in the mountains or out in the barn and there's these rules that you have to follow and they'll leave you alone like don't make a bunch of noise at night and stuff again very gremlins like and they don't listen to the rules and suddenly the elves start attacking the house and trying to kill people and it was a fun, goofy time, but I think by then I was just kind of sick of watching movies. So it's probably an unfair placement on this list, but I did watch the whole film and this is where it landed as far as my enjoyment. But if that sounds appealing to you, give it a shot. It is on VOD. I think it might even be like on Amazon Prime or something like that where you don't have to pay extra for it. But it, it was a goofy time that I wish I was in a better mood for. 28 Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, just a, kind of a movie that doesn't feel like it needs to exist. <laughs> and I kind of felt that way ever since they announced it. You know, I'm a huge fan of the original Pet Cemetery movie. I was very disappointed with the remake. And when they said they were going to be doing a prequel that's going to be exploring the story of Timmy Baderman, to me, like most horror prequels, unnecessary. You know, you're going to tell us a story that we already got the gist of and you're going to be answering questions that we weren't answering and likely give us answers that we didn't want that are more interesting with us just kind of filling out that story in our heads. And that's essentially what you get here. You get a very generic retelling of some of the Pet Cemetery beats. Only the most important and the most effective beats of the movie are left out. You know, the decision to bring a dead child back out of grief, that decision is made before the movie even starts. And so it's much more of like a, a zombie movie, like a zombie action horror movie by the third act than it really is a pet cemetery movie. Uh, I don't think that they added anything to the lore of pet cemetery. And they actually go as far as to kind of remove some really interesting things out of pet cemetery lore and retcon things to a certain extent that I didn't appreciate either. And the guy that we get here that is portraying Judd easily the least interesting version of Judd that we have ever gotten. Judd is not a character that can be vanilla. That's a character that is memorable because of his weirdness and his eccentricities. So watchable. That's about it. Number 27, Insidious, The Red Door, one of the more disappointing entries on this list that I wish was much higher. You know, I am a casual fan of Insidious, but I never really felt like there was much to go back and tell with this family. But what interested me was that Patrick Wilson was going to be the one directing it. And I like him a lot. I was very curious what he was going to be able to do as a director. And so I was very much bought in, watched the movie and while I think he does a pretty capable job as a director, he does a good job at setting up some of the scares in some of those scenes, like the one where he's in the the little scan machine and things are coming at him like almost through a tunnel. That was very effective. The story of this movie pretty much embodies the word unnecessary. You catch up with this family after seven or eight years, however long it's been since the second film. And the first 80, 85 percent of the movie you're spending with uh, the two main characters as they are rediscovering the events of the first two film, which everybody who's watching it, all of us Insidious fans already know everything that happened in those first two films. So the mystery that they're going on, we already know the answer to it. And so there's not really a whole lot of tension or suspense in waiting to find out anything or waiting for anything to be uncovered because we've already uncovered it years ago. And then when you finally get to the section of the movie that gets past that, and it's actually moving the plot forward, it's just kind of a retooled version of the third act of the first film and doesn't add really anything to the story or these characters. So very much this felt unnecessary in the sense that where we left these characters at the end of Insidious Chapter 2, it doesn't feel like we really made much of uh, an impact or a journey that was worth taking 
by going back to this family again in this fifth film. Number 26 is a movie called Malum, which is a remake of a movie called Last Shift that I have yet to see. I have it on good authority that that is the better version of this movie, so I'd like to see it eventually. But this is the same director of that original film remaking his film and just kind of retooling it and doing it in a little bit of a different way, I guess. Um, I was curious to check this out because I knew that Clark Wolf starred in it, and I used to watch her back in like the Collider movie talk days. But I was contacted by one of the producers uh, trying to get me to check this out and review it. But I only had like 24 hours to watch the film. And I watched it under the worst context possible. So this is another movie that is possibly uh, a bit of an unfair placement because I, I, it didn't have a very good uh, context for me to watch it in. Uh, this was the weekend that I was at Megacon in Orlando last year. It was after a day of panels and meet and greets and walking around and taking pictures and stuff. And so just physically and mentally exhausted by the end of the day, it was pretty late. Uh, and so me and Sean are literally in our hotel room. I have this code. I only have a couple more hours to watch this movie or it's gone. And when you watch a screener, a digital screener, and sometimes even physical screeners, usually there's some kind of a watermark where they have your name or your email address or a specific code that's tied to you that's somewhere on the screen. Sometimes they just pop up or they flash every once in a while. Sometimes it's there for the entirety of the movie, but usually the opacity of it is pretty low and it's in a part of the screen that's not very distracting. This was the worst watermark I have ever seen to where it was the entire center of the picture was my name and email address in pretty thick letters. So that was frustrating, but also we had to watch it on a laptop propped up on a table in a hotel room with laptop speakers after an exhausting day with that watermark. So, I mean, just about every single circumstance of our viewing experience was uh, not very good and was going to make the movie experience a little worse than it should have been. But overall, the movie, while having some creepy images and having a decent atmosphere, I felt like it was one of those movies that is so cerebral and mind bendy and trippy that it gets to a point where you never really know what's real and what's uh, an apparition or a hallucination. And it's to the extent where I start to just disengage from the movie because it feels like everything and nothing is real at the same time. And I no longer am really that engaged with any kind of danger or any kind of suspense with the main character, because I just don't know what to believe and what's real. It, it went a little bit too far in that direction for me. So maybe one day I'll check it out again. I would like to check out last shift because even those that watched it in a better context, I pretty much heard across the board that that's the better version, but Malum just a really bad viewing experience. And then a movie that didn't do a whole lot for me. Number 25 is The Blackening. And this is a movie that I was very curious about. Uh, the trailer seemed fairly funny. And so I was curious at, if this was going to be one of the movie experiences of the year that would hopefully make me laugh every year. That's like the hope that I have. Will some movie please just make me laugh this year? It didn't happen. Unfortunately, The Blackening is a movie that I could tell works really well for its target audience. Uh, it was me and pretty much the rest of the theater was all black people. And that's who this movie is written for and geared towards. Not that it's, it doesn't have widespread appeal, but there is a lot of jokes and a lot of dialogue and a lot of references in this movie that is very exclusive to the black community that the entire theater would erupt into laughter and I didn't get the joke. So the whole movie kind of felt like an inside joke that I was on the outside of. And so for my own personal viewing experience, it wasn't that good of an experience, but I could tell that the, who the movie was made for, they were nailing it. They, they were just nailing the humor there. So, um, kind of an easy movie to recommend and a hard movie to recommend because of all of that. It's basically, there's a bunch of black people in this, the little cabin and they find this board game called the blackening and this voice comes over and says, you know, uh, they give them these little tasks to do or whatever, but essentially it's like a satirical comedy to where the person that is least black is the one who's going to survive the situation. And so there's a lot of humor that comes in because of all of that. Uh, it was entertaining enough. Like it was a goofy fun time. I just wish that I could have been a part of a lot of the best jokes of the movie. And I just wasn't. 
Number 24 is The Haunted Mansion, the, the Disney horror film of the year. And this is a movie that feels like it's trying to do so many things. And it becomes like a, a embodiment of that phrase, a jack of all trades and a master of none. It wants to be a Disney movie. It wants to be kind of this uh, this movie version of a ride. It wants to be a horror movie. It wants to be a comedy movie. It wants to be a fantasy movie. It wants to bring all of that together. And it kind of feels like every single aspect of this movie was a bit of a half measure. An interesting cast, an interesting setting. I took my kids to see this, and even they were kind of lukewarm, bored on it. It's fine. It's watchable. It's decent enough, but it just feels like there's not really much of an impact being made in any aspect of the movie. And the main character's tragic story and his ties to his wife and the other goofy, kooky characters that come along. So there's not even like... It's a good cast, but it's a weird ensemble. <laughs> it's a very weird group of people put together. Uh, some of the the digital effects were were kind of cool and definitely have the effect of the Disney ride. But I don't know, just kind of an empty experience. You know, you watched it and then until I was making this list, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot that came out this year. Last Voyage of the Demeter at 23. And this is a movie that I actually, for some reason, didn't hear about until like a couple of weeks before the movie was coming out. I did a video where I was talking about my most anticipated horror films for the rest of the year. And I got like 12 comments and in the first hour, they were like, what about Last Voyage of Demeter? And I was like, what the fuck is that? I go to see the trailer and apparently it's this vampire flick. And I'm like, oh, my God, how did I not hear about that? How did I not get an email about this? What the fuck? So this is taking like one chapter out of Bram Stoker's novel Dracula and making a whole movie about it. The This voyage of the Demeter, the ship that gets Dracula from Transylvania to like London or whatever. And so the whole movie is essentially these people in this isolated situation. They're on the sea and there is this vampire that is living on the ship that comes out and feeds at night. And the movie starts off really interesting because I love well done period pieces. Um, it adds a lot of tension because they don't have any modern technology to help them out. I love vampire films and this seemed like it was going to be dark and bloody and graphic. And, and I miss those types of vampire films. I like the fact that they were going for more the animalistic side of Dracula. He's only in like that semi bat form the entire movie, but it felt like the movie kind of got into this repetitive rut of storytelling to where you have these characters and they're on the ship and they're discussing things. And then nightfall comes and one random dude goes off to do something and Dracula shows up in the shadows bites him and then people are the next day are like where's jim i don't know where the hell is jim and they just kind of did that over and over again until the third act where the remaining characters are kind of taking on dracula head on and they're trying to find dracula so some decent action in there uh, i think some of the effects there with how dracula looked were pretty good when it was practical there was some cgi that certainly i could have done without but, you know, overall, it was a fine experience. It's just I think my hopes for what the potential of the movie could have been far outweighed what they actually achieved here. And uh, it set up some things to where I just wanted to explore this more and exploring it more is the rest of the novel Dracula. So choosing to do this one chapter and make a whole movie out of that, I think ultimately was kind of the, the mistake of the concept here. Number 22 is where the devil roams this is another movie I saw at fantastic fest. And you know, it's a little bit over an hour, so it is feature length, but it's one of the shorter movies on this list. And the first half of the movie, I struggled quite a bit because you don't really get an idea of where the story is going and what exactly we're doing here. And then as soon as you're introduced to what we're actually doing here, I actually enjoyed the second half quite a bit. You have this family who are carnival workers and they're kind of fucked up people. I don't really know how to describe it so well, but, you know, they, they, they go off and they start to meet people and they start to go into people's houses and, you know, bad things happen. And what's cool about this movie is that it's made by an actual family. Like the people who are starring in this movie as the family are also the ones who made the film as a family. And there's this really cool visual aesthetic that they bring to it they bring like this music video dark flavor to it in certain parts of the points of the movie that was really interesting and unique and that's what i appreciated the most about it was kind of the story of how this movie came about and the passion of this family and where things go by the last 10 to 15 minutes are very fucked up and macabre and 
I, I dug where things ultimately went. It, it takes a bit to get there, so certainly it tests your patience a bit in the first 40 minutes or so, but uh, if you can find this online on VOD to check it out, I would encourage you to if you want to have just kind of a weird, trippy experience for a little over an hour. Number 21 is the Sacrifice game. Also saw this at Fantastic Fest, but it dropped just a couple of weeks ago on VOD. And this is where you have this boarding school and everybody goes off for the holiday except for two little girls that don't have anywhere to go. So the two little girls and the staff that is left over in this little private school and this murderous cult descends on the school and that's about all I'm going to tell you about it because otherwise we're going to start to get into spoilers and, and give hints of where things go but I thought that the performances were pretty entertaining here you got Mina Masoud in this who was the guy who played Aladdin and I haven't seen him do anything since Aladdin and he's he's very intentionally over the top here but it was entertaining and I think that the the main little girl who's kind of quiet and a little bit awkward in this uh, group of this school was really good as far as her performance. Ultimately, I felt like where the movie is trying to surprise you with twists and turns, they show their hand a bit too early. Uh, there's a scene in a bathroom between the two girls where uh, an exchange is made between them. And that that scene has no purpose other than to set up something that's going to be revealed later on. And it's so obvious for that that you always kind of have your guard up after that scene on where things are ultimately going to go. And so I feel like the movie would have been a lot more effective without that scene and just kind of let us really get for some kind of a surprise by the third act of where things were ultimately going. And instead, they decided to hint at it way too directly. Number 20 is Five Nights at Freddy's, one of, if not the most successful horror film of the year, one of the more successful films of the year, period, made buckets of money. Um, the movie was fine. You know, I'm somebody who's not overly familiar with Five Nights at Freddy's. I did play a little bit of it on my gaming channel just to familiarize myself with it. An interesting concept. I guess I get the appeal, but I'm not into all of the lore and the backstory and the fan theories. And, you know, this is a massively popular IP that I don't really have much of an attachment to. So I walked into this thing purely out of curiosity as a movie fan, and I had a decent enough time with it. I thought that it was a fun enough experience you know it wasn't a great story they didn't have a ton in here that they decided to put in to really merit this movie being uh in existence within this franchise but for fans of the movie it was like avengers endgame all over again like there was so many just vocal people and kids and teenagers in this theater that i could tell certain things in the movie were like big fan service moments but they meant nothing to anybody that didn't already know the backstory or the lore or certain identities of YouTubers or anything like that. So this is absolutely a movie that was made for the fans. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're not a part of that group of fans that's able to enjoy and get you know hyped and excited about these moments, the experience is a lot emptier for us. Uh, I had the reverse of this experience when uh, Welcome to Raccoon City came out, a movie that was very much full of fan service for the first two Resident Evil games, but doesn't do anything to onboard people that don't already have that pre-established love. Same problem here. So it was entertaining enough. I'm curious enough to watch more in this franchise, but definitely a movie that you have to be a fan to get the most out of. Number 19 is Wrath of Becky, and this is a sequel to the movie Becky from like 2021. Wasn't a big fan of that movie where you get the little girl and she is battling a bunch of neo-Nazis, Home Alone style, but cranked up to rated R. This one is carrying on with her story as a much older girl. She's a teenager at this point, and it, she's taking on a group of, you know, white supremacists, basically. And it's, you know, same concept, very similar, but I felt this one was a lot more enjoyable. Uh, I think that she was more enjoyable as a character, as this psychotic person. You know, I just felt it was, I don't know, a little bit more palatable, I guess, whenever she was older versus when she was this little girl. And the cast of characters here for the bad guys, I was much more entertained by. You know, I, I didn't think that Kevin James did a very good job as the villain, which sucks to say because I love that guy and I was curious to see what he was going to do as a horror villain. It didn't work for me. Here you have Sean William Scott Stifler playing the, the lead bad guy. I think he was much more convincing. I thought he did a really good job, actually. You also have uh, Malachi himself in here, Courtney Gaines, as a pretty entertaining character. So 
you know, a movie that's not aiming very high, nor did I expect very much from it, but I enjoyed it a good bit more than the first film. And uh, there's some pretty direct teases of where they're going to go in the future if they continue making these. And I'm all for it. I'm there. Bring on more Becky. Coming in at 18 is another Fantastic Fest film. This is The Last Video Store, and this is a Canucksploitation film, if I said that correct correctly. It's a Canadian exploitation movie. And you have this girl where her father dies, and she goes to return these VHS tapes that he had to this video store that's this little rinky-dink hole in the wall. And the guy that owns it runs. It's a very quirky film nerd. And they get locked in. She has this VHS tape that's essentially like the Necronomicon and when they put that into the VCR, it opens this portal to where things, characters, monsters from these other VHS tapes that are made up movies start to come into the real world. And so it's like a three act structure where you have a monster movie that's kind of like the monster that was originally going to be the creature in Predator. That little bug looking thing is attacking them in the store then you get a section that's like a riff on friday the 13th and the killer comes through and then you have this very corny 80s action hero that comes out that turns out to be kind of a bad guy it was a lot of fun like it's a movie where if you understand what they're making fun of and they're taking little shots at and they're riffing on you have a lot of enjoyment uh if you're not a part of that if you're not in the know of what exactly they're paying satire and parody on it's probably a pretty silly experience. Um, the only handicap the movie has is that it's such a small, isolated setting that there's not a whole lot of room for them to do much in the movie. But I had a good time with it. You know, for a low budget, goofy movie that's just riffing on a lot of my favorite types of movies from the 80s, I had a really fun time with it. Number 17 is Knock at the Cabin. This is the latest M. Night Shyamalan film. And, you know, for the first third of this movie, I thought this is maybe going to be the best movie that he has made in a very long time. Shyamalan's weird. You know, he's got a very complicated history with his movies. He's made some of the best movies ever, especially early on in his career. Then he had this little era where he made almost nothing but trash. And then now he's kind of on this up and down pattern to where like he'll make a great movie, then he'll make a terrible movie and just goes up and down. And his last movie, Old, I thought was dreadful. So to me, he was he was due for a good one. And the concept here where you have these four people that descend on this cabin with this family inside and they say that they are the horsemen of the apocalypse and one of you has to kill another one of you. Like you have to kill one of the members of your family. Otherwise, the apocalypse is going to happen today. And it's a very creepy and unnerving concept. And you have Dave Bautista here as kind of the leader doing a really good job. His best performance so far. You have Rupert Grinton here from the Harry Potter movies doing a great job as well. And it just sets up this really eerie scenario where you're just sucked in. You can't wait to see what happens. But where the movie fails is that, again, after the first act or so, where it really is starting to, to get you into this concept and starts to really shock you with where things are going it kind of gets into this wash, rinse, repeat pattern to where they've asked the family, like, okay, are you ready to make the sacrifice? They say no. And then one of the four horsemen kills themselves in a violent way. And then they look at the, the TV and something starts to happen out in the world that is certainly looking like the apocalypse is coming. And then they just do that over and over and over again. And so you get into way too much of a repetitive and, and derivative pattern in the story to where the movie kind of gets less interesting as it goes on. And without saying too much here, although the movie has been out for months, M night Shyamalan is known if nothing else for always having some crazy twist in his movies and, and the vast majority of them. And this is a movie where he decided not to do that. He decided to just have a straightforward story and not have anything in the third act. That's going to reframe the events or pull the rug out from under you. And this is a movie that absolutely needed that because it just kind of ends. And, you know, it even has a different ending than the book that it's based off of or the short story. And when you actually read the original ending of the original story, it's such a better and more impactful ending that it kind of baffles you about why you would change that and go in a much less interesting and a much more vanilla route. So the movie just kind of peters out. So it had potential there. You know, it's definitely a movie I would recommend to people that like Shyamalan stuff, but it just felt like one of his films that really needed that Shyamalan edge, and he decided to play it straight. 
for some odd reason. Number 16 is going to be Megan, Chucky's girlfriend. And this was a very early movie in 2023. And you know, I was not expecting much from this. It was something that seemed like it was quietly going to come out. And then it kind of went viral on TikTok with everybody doing the dance that's in the trailer. And suddenly there was like a lot more marketability for it. And it ended up being really successful. You know, Blumhouse, they're, they're pretty fucking genius at putting a little bit of money into something and getting a whole lot in return. So we're going to get more Megan movies. There's even talks of Megan versus Chucky, which God help us. But um, the movie was fine. You know, the, the Megan doll was an interesting concept. Essentially, this movie takes what the Child's Play 2019 remake did and just does it in a little bit different way. I prefer the way they did it in the Child's Play remake myself, but I thought this was still pretty good, pretty entertaining. Uh, I preferred the rated R unrated version, but even that annoyed me. Like they cut this to PG 13 after it went viral. Cause they knew they're going to get way more money for it. And I, I even said in my review within a week of this movie coming out, they're going to announce the unrated Blu-ray or the unrated VOD cuts, to try to get a double dip. And they absolutely did. And when you double dipped, there really wasn't a whole lot there <laughs> as far as added gore. Um, you had like the little ear stretch scene that shows the ear being torn off very quickly. You the the little um, power washer kill shows like an extra second of skin being blown off. Uh, there's a few more f bombs in the movie, but it, it was definitely a ridiculous little unnecessary marketing ploy. But nonetheless, the movie was entertaining enough. My daughter really likes it. She's a big Chucky fan and she loved Megan, maybe even more than Chucky because she's a girl. Makes sense. Uh, I'm fine with it being a franchise. I'll look forward to Megan too, but you know, this, this wasn't a standout of the year. It was just good. Number 15 is suitable flesh. Another movie I saw at fantastic fest that is available on VOD. And this is a movie that if there was just a few tweaks to it, probably would have made my top 10 at least, uh, you have, it's an HP Lovecraft version of a story. It might even be like a, a, an adaptation of one of his stories, but it's HP Lovecraft styled movie that kind of has a Skinamax flavor to it. So Heather Graham is this psychologist. She gets this kid that comes in who is the kid from the babysitter movies. And he says, Hey, you know, my, my father's trying to take over my body. Obviously he sounds like he's whacked out of his head, but she sees things that prove that maybe this kid is not completely out of his mind. And so you have this very erotic, like seductive story going on between doctor and patient. All the while, you absolutely have this entity that is trying to body swap and take over this kid's body and move to another vessel. And so Heather Graham gets wrapped up in all of that. I think that the horror side of things, the HP Lovecraft body uh, swap style stuff was really cool, really effective and pretty creepy. Then you get into the erotic thriller side of things. And while, you know, it's it's effective at creating kind of this this sexy, seductive tone, it's very oddly reserved to where there's full on like porno dialogue going on. I mean, they are graphic as far as the dialogue and really leaning into that Skinamax side of things. But when the sex scenes come, of which there are a number of them, everybody's fully clothed. And it's very reserved as far as nudity, which just feels so out of place in a movie that is not reserved whatsoever in the dialogue. It is not reserved whatsoever in the gore. And so that felt so strange when you're watching it. And it kind of takes you out of the moments where you're like, I, I should be getting into this. And this should feel like this really crazy, fucked up, erotic thriller. But it just feels like we're trying to be suggestive while at the same time be reserved. And it was just combating with itself in that way. So I, I like this. I had a good time with it, but it definitely was an oddly crafted movie in that way. Number 14 is the Toxic Avenger remake. I have no idea when the fuck this is going to be released. This was the opening movie in Fantastic Fest, and I'm kind of shocked that they still haven't had a release date for this. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes straight to VOD. Just feels like one of those things that they would have a hard time marketing. But this will come out at some point in 2024. Uh, I watched the original Toxic Avenger the day before we went to go see this for the first time, and um it's an interesting experience. I liked it more than I thought I was going to, but it's definitely a movie that is very for a specific audience and you either are really going to get into it or you're really going to be repulsed by it. And 
it also brought up the question of how do you do a modern version of that? I mean, if you've seen the original Toxic Avenger, it is absolutely like bottom of the barrel level of crass. You have the villains of the movie that are introduced to us. They're driving around in a car, like hitting people for points and they run over a small child. And when they realize the kid's not dead, they back up and they run over his head and his head explodes like a watermelon. That's the type of movie you're going for. There's a scene where a blind lady is sitting in a fast food restaurant and these robbers come in and they shoot her seeing eye dog and then proceed to try to sexually assault her. That's the original toxic of toxic Avenger. And so you're like, how the fuck can you make a modern version of that? And you obviously can't recreate that type of stuff. Cause that just would not fly nowadays. But if you shave all of that off and try to go more in a mainstream direction, you're not toxic Avenger. So what are they going to do? And when you see the new movie, I actually think they do a pretty good job at finding a compromise here because it's definitely a movie that is crass and is gore fueled and is really campy and goofy. But at the same time, it's not as, you know, as violent or as um, offensive, I guess, is the right word as the originals. And so. I don't know. I, I had a good time with it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I dug it for what it was doing. Peter Dinklage does a good job. Kevin Bacon plays the villain. It was pretty entertaining. Uh, I think that the look of Toxie was pretty good. There's a lot of gore here. And uh, I thought that that was uh, it was a fun level of gore. And even when it's more CGI gore, it kind of fits the tone of the movie. So all of the over the top gore and kills and blood splatter that they put into this to try to make up for all of the the offensive things that they can't really go into it made an entertaining movie for me uh, where toxic Avenger fans are going to land on it. I really don't know. They might appreciate the new angles or they might hate the fact that this is kind of a sanitized toxic Avenger. We'll find out when it comes out, but I liked it coming in at number 13 is going to be scream six and the first 85% of this movie. This was my favorite scream sequel. And then the ghost face masks came off and this movie went off a cliff. Uh, I love the New York setting. I like these new characters quite a bit. I was not really that upset or worried about the absence of Nev Campbell, although I'm a huge fan of hers and I definitely wanted her to get what she deserved and get her payday. But narratively, I didn't think that uh, Scream 5 did a bad job at all at setting up these new characters in a way where they could kind of carry on without the legacy characters. That's just me. Uh, I like the more aggressive ghost face that we get in this movie. The kills were all pretty good. It was a damn solid Scream movie all the way up into the point where the killer is revealed and the motivations are revealed. And for me, this it was the least satisfying third act of any of the Scream films by a landslide. Really goofy and hokey performances that didn't make sense in the movie. Uh, the motivations and the identities of the killer were very predictable and kind of disappointing. Didn't lack much of a punch there. There are massive logic issues that come out in the third act. And even when you rewatch the film, a few of them in the first couple of acts that just kind of strain credibility. So this was definitely one of the more disappointing movie experiences of the year. And now that we've had all this drama regarding scream seven, and we're obviously not going to get a continuation with these characters or this story, it kind of makes five and especially six a little bit worse in hindsight, because it feels like we're kind of abandoning this section of this franchise and not completing these arcs and not bringing everything to its its full conclusion and so it kind of has this awkward ickiness to it now unfortunately but you know it is what it is scream six solid enough you know for the most part but very very disappointing third act number 12 is going to be eli roth's thanksgiving this was based off of the fake trailer in the grindhouse movie that came out like 13 15 years ago with robert rodriguez and quentin tarantino and fans have been wanting this to become a full movie for quite a long time. We finally got it this year. And this was a, a fun enough slasher. You know, it kind of goes for the scream vibe a little bit with the whodunit. It also leans pretty heavily into the Thanksgiving holiday. You have this massacre that happens in the opening act at a Black Friday sale. And then a year later, a killer comes back to kind of avenge that massacre. And there's some pretty creative kills here. Very effective gore. That's one thing you can always count on Eli Roth delivering. 
Uh, I really like the killer here, John Carver. I like the fact that they lean into the Thanksgiving holiday with some of the kills and the aesthetic of the movie. The writing and the performances of most of the characters is where the movie let me down quite a bit. I never really care for the characters in Eli Roth films. They He writes most of them to be kind of like these frat boy douchebags. You get a lot of that in this movie because they're high school kids. There's not really any distinct personality traits or characteristics of these these kids that make them stand out. Even the one that you know lives to the end and be, kind of becomes your your final girl. I can't tell you jack shit about them. So the only characters that really stood out are a couple of the the more seasoned actors like Patrick Dempsey and, and you know people that we already have kind of a relationship with as actors, so they stand out a little bit more. But yeah, the the dialogue was pretty grating especially in the first act of the movie when we were introduced to these characters in this Black Friday massacre. I was getting really worried, like, oh, no, are they going to crank up that East Coast Boston douchebag personality on everybody? Luckily, they tempered it down a little bit after that first act. But, yeah, dialogue wise and and script wise, I felt like the movie was not quite as good as I had hoped it was going to be still a very entertaining slasher still delivers most of what you want and what you need to have be done well in a slasher to be something that I could say is a good experience. And like I said, I, I in my review, I do look forward to rewatching it. Um, I actually bought the VOD uh, version of this movie so that I could watch it before the Blu-ray comes out. So maybe I'll do that tonight. I don't know. But I like Thanksgiving. Just wish I could have loved it. Number 11 was one of the last movies that I watched this year, and that is Dark Harvest. This is something that came out back in like the Halloween season, and I was just way too busy to check it out, but heard little rumblings about it. Didn't really know what it was about. And uh, about two or three weeks ago, I just randomly threw it on. And this was a pretty cool little movie. Uh, Again, a lot like Thanksgiving. I wish I could have loved it. I wish that it was a little bit better executed because there's a lot of things about it that I really enjoyed. But overall, cool little concept. You have this little uh, agriculture town, very similar to like Children of the Corn, And every single year they have this little ritual that they do on Halloween night where all of the kids in the town, all the teenagers are locked up in a room. They're starved and then they are let out to like go be feral and violent and they have to race to try to kill this scarecrow that is created uh, called what the fuck is the thing called? And this scarecrow is called Sawtooth Jack. It's made out of a, a dead body, a corpse that has a jack-o'-lantern on it, and it becomes sentient. It comes alive on Halloween night, and it tries to get to this church in town, and it, it lays waste to everybody that gets in his way. So you have this monster that is cutting through this town. Meanwhile, you have all these feral kids trying to kill this thing. And the the ritual is whatever kid kills the thing kind of becomes this town hero for the night. The family gets a whole shitload of money and they are allowed to then leave this town. And so it sets up this scenario and you have this main character who is the, the younger brother of the kid that won last year. And he kind of has something to prove. His parents don't want him to do it because it's very dangerous. He could die and they already got their prize. They already got like their their big pot of money. They don't see the point there. And so it's it's a cool Halloween aesthetic concept with a really cool looking villain in Sawtooth Jack. And there are some nice little twists and turns that are revealed in the movie while this uh, this Halloween ritual is going on. Where the movie falls flat for me is the main character, uh, the younger brother that we're following. I don't really think he's a very interesting character. He's not very likable. You never quite really buy into his determination and his need to participate in this ritual. Um, And even some of the surrounding characters, like this girl that he has a bit of a romance with and some of the more douchebag bullies that he has, a bit of an antagonistic relationship with the character wise, the movie is not very appealing. And that was the biggest letdown for me. Whereas if I really liked the main character was invested in him and, and believed in this budding romance, I think it could have been a, a more holistic experience all around for the movie. But I pretty much was just taken about taken away with the concept and the, the killer and uh, really the, the creative things that they did with uh, the initial setup of the movie. So It's cool. It's fun, Uh, especially in the Halloween season. It's worth checking out, but 
falls a bit short from becoming like this new Halloween classic for me. And now we're into the top 10 and the best horror films of the year. Coming in at number 10 is No One Will Save You, which is another movie that I saw way late in the year. I did not get a chance to watch this when it first dropped on Hulu. It was the, the week that I was in Austin, Texas for the Fantastic Fest. And so I just didn't have room after the festival to watch other movies. Uh, and this is essentially a, a silent film, kind of. It's a dialogue-free movie to where you get uh, this girl that lives by herself in this little farmhouse, and there is an alien invasion happening in her town. And so you have extraterrestrials coming in. It's a very similar approach to, like, signs with uh, the tone of the alien invasion. And uh, these aliens keep descending on her farmhouse, and she's fighting them off. And I, I thought it was a really cool movie, especially since I watched it like a day after I saw Silent Night, the action film that also had no dialogue. I thought that was terrible. This was a significantly better executed version of that concept of having no dialogue. And the movie, it, it, it sets it up in a way to where you actually don't even notice that there's no dialogue because it's such a tension filled experience that there's not like these gaps where you should be hearing characters talk because it's just her and it's just her reacting to this situation and her hiding and her trying to survive this situation uh, for the most part. Uh, where the movie ultimately goes by the third act, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening that when you start diving into more of the psychology, the main character and some of her past trauma and why she lives by herself and why the town's a little standoffish with her. Uh, when you start to learn more and more about that by the third act, they decide to end it on a note that's a little bit more of a, a thematic through line for all of that. And I don't know if it was the most satisfying way to wrap up the movie, in my own opinion. Uh, I get what they were trying to do there. I get the, again, the, the thematic conclusion that they were bringing as far as her character arc and, and what her character needed. But it felt a little bit more metaphoric than surface level. And I think I would have preferred more of a surface level ending to this story with how well and how tense everything else was in the film. So I really dug this one, uh, would definitely recommend you checking it out if you have not seen it. It's a really cool experimental type alien abduction movie. But you know, again, maybe maybe a little bit too smart, I guess, by the third act than what I wanted. Number nine is going to be Infinity Pool. This is another movie that I saw very early on in the year, and it has stuck with me throughout most of the year. It's a very weird and trippy and wild and fucked up movie. Uh, this is Brandon Cronenberg, the son of David Cronenberg. If you saw his movie Possessor from a few years back, that was a pretty wild, weird, intense, gore-filled movie. And what you have here is that uh, Alexander Skarsgård and his wife are like rich people. They're out on this little island paradise, and they're bored. Um, they have all these opportunities, and they're, they're in a paradise, and they just can't be bothered to find any entertainment because it, that, that stuff is just lost on somebody that's as rich as them, I guess. And they come across this couple of Mia Goth and her husband, and they essentially get them into a situation where they have broken some laws and they tell them, don't worry about it. Like, we'll take care of it. They end up getting arrested and getting tried for this and being sentenced to death. But because they are rich, this island has this little policy where if you can afford it, you can pay to have a clone of yourself created and have your clone undergo the punishment for your crimes the death penalty. And so they do that. They pay to have these clones created and they watch their clones be executed for their crimes. And that's just the setup of the movie. And it essentially sets up this scenario to where the rich and privileged are able to do whatever the fuck they want because they can just essentially buy their way out of the punishment. And so it starts to explore not only the the privilege of the rich and how the rich are not held accountable and you know things like that that are it's very much a topic of discussion pretty heavily all the time but especially today while at the same time exploring what it is that guides your moral compass is it an inherent understanding and value of good and bad right and wrong or is it simply just the fear of consequence that makes us do good rather than bad and give in to our, our more animalistic 
instincts. And so I found the movie to be really profound with the way that it explored all of that and, and really thought provoking with the way that it explored all of that. All the while, it's got a lot of really trippy visuals and a lot of really crazy, wacky directions that it goes. Mia Goth kind of goes off the deep end with her performance. And, you know, it, 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 you're either going to love or hate it. She gets a little grating with it uh, to a degree, but she's wild to watch. Alexander Skarsgård is wild to watch. And by the end of the film, I just found myself wanting to talk about it and wanting to talk about the things that it was exploring and the, the questions that it was bringing up and the things that it wanted to discuss. And this was a year where I definitely valued those types of movie experiences more than I typically do. There was so much in the middle section of the movies that I saw this year that are just like these empty, forgettable, blockbuster, generic experiences that movies like this that are certainly weird and not necessarily a rewatchable movie, but something that provokes thoughts and provokes conversations I actually valued that quite a bit. So I dug Infinity Pool much more than I thought I was going to. And by the end of the year, it's one of the movies I'm going to remember 2023 for the most. Number eight is a movie called Cobweb that came out of absolutely nowhere for me. This was released the weekend that Barbenheimer happened and nobody gave a fuck about Cobweb. Nobody was talking about it, namely the people that made and released the movie. It felt like they were just trying to like hide it and just expend it out there and just be done with it. And I reached out and was able to get a screener for this because I didn't have any theaters near me that was playing it. And I wasn't expecting much because of the way that they released it. I figured they had no faith in it. Why the hell should I have any faith in it? So I watched it with negative expectations. And I was shocked how much I really liked this. This was a really cool little horror film that I think is a shame it did not come out in October because it would have been a perfect October horror film. It kind of creates this fairy tale vibe and this fairy tale aesthetic to the movie that I thought was really interesting and the way that it uses shadows and silhouettes uh, kind of from the perspective of a kid to color that out a bit. Uh, you have Anthony Starr here and Lizzie Kaplan as these parents that are very unnerving and very creepy. And I liked how the movie begins as something and ends as something entirely different. It takes you on a journey where you definitely don't quite know where you're going. Uh, and it's really creepy and intriguing all the way throughout. There's a nightmare sequence in here that is one of the creepiest scenes of the year. It, it falls apart a little bit in the third act just because of how rushed things feel. You know, it comes to a very quick ending. And there are certain things about some of the reveals and where things ultimately go in the third act that uh, could have been done a little bit better. So it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a magnificent experience or anything. There was certainly some issues there that I could see being a bit too much for some people, but I had such low expectations that I ended up being really surprised with how much I dug this one. Number seven is Renfield, a movie that came out a bit earlier in the year as well that I've continued to remember and, and uh, talk about. And this was essentially just known as the Nicolas Cage Dracula movie. You have Nicholas Holt, who is playing Renfield, who is like the the slave assistant to Dracula. Dracula is played by Nicolas Cage brilliantly. Uh, you only get chunks of him in the movie, but it's it's so good. He's like tapping into the Bela Lugosi side of Dracula while definitely turning up a bit of the Nicolas Cage flavor in there. And this is a, a horror action comedy. Really solid action and fight scenes, super over-the-top blood and gore, and uh, some pretty funny scenarios and things going on here too where Renfield is trying to break free from the ties of Dracula he wants to be independent and he wants to it's treated as like a toxic relationship and so he goes to like um like AA meetings and stuff for battered wives and shit so it's it's a really fun entertaining movie that I had a really good time with the only negative of the movie was that I didn't care for Aquafina. I, I just don't like her as an actress she seems like a perfectly fine person I got nothing against her but anytime she's in a movie she's like one of my least favorite parts to it so didn't love her performance or her character and there's this cop side story going on that that kind of centers around her character that is very much the B side story. And that was always kind of a distracting part of the movie. It comes full circle by the end of it and how it ties back into Dracula. But anytime we deviated from the Renfield and Dracula stuff to this cop versus mob family stuff, it just felt like a different movie. Coming in at number six is Totally Killer. Another movie I saw at Fantastic Fest this is actually the closing film of the festival. And then it went on Amazon Prime, I believe. And this was a very fun movie. Uh, like I said earlier with It's a Wonderful Life, I really like this whole 
take a classic movie and mix it into a slasher concept that we've gotten quite a few over the last number of years. And this was one of the better ones. You have this town to where back in the 80s, there was this serial killer that killed like three or four girls on Halloween night. And it's continued to kind of be the legacy of this town. And you have the, the girl who's the main character. Her mom was the survivor of that situation. And right at the beginning of the movie, the killer comes back in modern day, kills the mom. And so the, the, the main character is on the run from the killer and accidentally gets into a time machine and goes back to the 80s. And so you have a back to the future scenario to where a kid goes back to the 80s, uh, the, the time where their parents were in high school, meets her mom and her dad and is kind of navigating that situation and navigating how different things were in the 80s versus modern times, while you also have this lingering slasher thing, uh, the slasher whodunit angle, where she's trying to figure out who the killer is and how to stop the killer from not only killing the people that he originally killed in the 80s, but especially her mom in modern times. And I think they had a lot of fun with this concept. The kills were fun and effective, you know, not overly creative, but at least it was full on rated R. Uh, I liked a lot of the humor in the movie. I think that they did a really fun job and had a nice balance of having like a modern borderline woke teenager go back to the 80s where everything was much more crass and her just kind of reacting and calling out everything. And they did it in a way to where they definitely hold a mirror up to the way that things used to be and show kind of the the error of the ways of the past, while at the same time holding the mirror against the teenager and showing how obnoxious and self-righteous that she is. And so I like when they're able to do that, where they're able to point the finger and make fun of everybody equally, and we can all get a good laugh out of it, because typically the truth is in the middle on most situations. So I appreciated that they were able to do that. Uh, the only section of the movie that didn't fully work for me was the whodunit side of things. By the time you get to the ultimate reveals and answers in the third act, there's a section of it that was extremely predictable to a very disappointing degree. And there's another section of it that kind of uh, comes out of nowhere that you're never really able to be on the detective side of things. You're never really able to sniff that out because it was never introduced. Uh, can't get too specific, but if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. But I had a really good time with this one. It was a great film to end the festival on and uh, one of the more rewatchable movies that came out this year. Coming in at number five, we've got Evil Dead Rise. This is a movie that was originally supposed to go to HBO Max, and they eventually said it's so good it needs to go to theaters. And I had a really good time with this one. I wasn't quite as high on it as it seemed a lot of other people were, but I still dug it and really enjoyed it. It's in my top five, for Christ's sake. Why am I even trying to defend this? Uh, you have the Evil Dead classic scenario, but it's in this high-rise apartment building. So a little bit of a change of setting that was cool and was familiar, while at the same time being very familiar with all of the Evil Dead tropes, if you will. Uh, so a very much a classic Evil Dead experience with a new skin on it. I like the fact that they were bold in making the mom, the deadite, and the kids are the ones that have to escape this evil. They are very unforgiving with putting these kids in danger and putting them through a lot of hell, which you know sometimes can feel like a bit too much, but this movie, it just kind of felt like it was really ballsy. Uh, you get the full-on gore and the nasty kills and everything you want in Evil Dead, some very creepy stuff going on. Uh, ultimately, I think the only thing that held it back from being even higher on this list was that even though we had a lot of these new elements, it still feels very run-of-the-mill Evil Dead. Uh, you know, we have five of these movies now, and they all kind of deliver the same section of horror entertainment. They do it very well. It's one of the most consistent franchises out there alongside Scream. But I, I feel like I wanted a little bit more new from this movie. And by the end of it, it was... 80% familiar with 20% different stuff. Uh, and I just wanted a, a, a bit of a different flavor of Evil Dead by this point. Number four is going to be When Evil Lurks. And this is another film I saw at Fantastic Fest. Whenever I left the festival, this was my number one film, my favorite film of the festival. I, I've since swapped it to number two, but uh, for, for reasons that I'll make sense of here very soon. When Evil Lurks is a movie that I didn't know anything about. I walked into blind. And what this is is an Argentina possession movie. And it uses the lore and kind of the culture of Argentina to make this a very unique take on possession to where it almost feels more like a zombie outbreak movie because the possession is like 
infecting the town. And again, it plays more into local lore and local legend. So it, it, it's... The biggest thing I valued about it is that it takes possession movies, a subgenre of horror that is just dime a dozen, wash, rinse, repeat, the same collection of ideas, and it does a very unique spin on it, which I really appreciated. It is so brutal and unforgiving with the violence and the gore. It is very creepy and effective at just shocking you out of nowhere multiple times throughout the movies, both in a jump scare format as well as just visually what you're seeing on screen. And it takes you on this journey to where you're you're genuinely like unnerved the entire time and unsure of like what hope is there in this situation. It feels like there's none. So a very, very intense experience, a very unforgiving experience that also makes it not the most rewatchable movie in the world, which is why I have since dropped it to number two, uh, just given time and thinking about it and everything like that. But uh, it's a movie where if you like possession movies and you want something different, or if you're somebody who doesn't like possession movies because you never get anything different, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Just be prepared to have your stomach churned a lot. Coming in at number three is going to be Godzilla minus one. Now, again, this is horror adjacent. This is much more of the action side of a horror film, but Godzilla is definitively a horror character, a horror villain in this take. Uh, and so I felt like it was necessary to put it on this list. I'm somebody who does not like Godzilla movies whatsoever. And there's really none of them that I care for except Godzilla minus one. And I had no interest in even checking this out until I started to hear a lot of the buzz about it. And I was like, fine, I'm curious. Let me go check it out. And what this ended up being was a really interesting exploration of post World War II Japan and it's diving into like post-war guilt. The main character is a kamikaze pilot who didn't fulfill his duty. So he kind of has survivor's guilt in a certain way. And all the while you have this impending doom of Godzilla in the background. And it's the first time where the titular monster is this thing in the background that we just get a few sequences with that I wasn't constantly wanting more out of the monster and less out of the humans. I liked the humans, was invested in their story, was invested in their arcs and the themes they were exploring here. And then every once in a while, we'd get this kick-ass Godzilla sequence, and it was like, oh, cool, we also get that. Uh, so this was just a really well-done story. The Godzilla effects are incredible, especially for the amount of money they spent on this, which was just nothing compared to what we spend on blockbusters here in America. Uh, there was a lot of tension and a lot of like the like the sense of doom, that impending doom that I want from a Godzilla movie. And like I said, he's he's a villain. He's a, a horror character. He's this scary presence in the movie, which more times than not in the American films, he's like this action antihero that's here to beat up the other monster. And I much prefer this take on Godzilla. So by the end of the year, this was not only one of my more surprising experiences, but uh, it was one of the, the the better movies that I saw. And makes it all the way up to number three on this list. Coming in at number two is the biggest surprise of the year, and that is Saw X. I am not a massive Saw fan whatsoever. I was not looking forward to this. I was not sold on the trailer. To me, I just kind of rolled my eyes like, we're doing this again. Oh, of course, it's going to be a prequel because we got to have Tobin Bell back, and you dumbasses should have never killed him in three. I could not have been more pessimistic about this. Saw it at Fantastic Fest at a secret screening, and walked out and went, holy shit, that was the best Saw movie. <laughs> and could not wait to tell everybody I was wrong and to get excited for it. And uh, so retroactively, I have made this my number one movie of Fantastic Fest. Uh, because it's the movie that, of the festival especially, but it, you know, number two of the year as far as horror for me that has excited me the most. And I've you know wanted to talk about it the most. And I've done a lot of Saw videos. I did a number of rankings. I ranked the traps. I ranked the... the the twist. I did a video where I, I made like a pitch for the story ideas for Saw 11. And so where I at one point of this year was somebody that, you know, I liked Saw, but certainly was not overly excited about it. And about half the franchise I could care less if I ever watched again to suddenly being somebody who's very excited for Saw and is into talking about Saw and wants to revisit the movies and kind of dive into them a little bit more. And that all comes from the experience of Saw X, where finally putting 
Tobin Bell and Jigsaw in the forefront made just such a significant difference for me and effectively making him the hero of the movie, even though we know he's a psycho and he's a killer and he's a bad guy. But you introduce us to these people and put this situation where we hate them significantly more than we hate or judge Jigsaw. And so you're able to create this situation where he puts people into traps that you want to see them go into the traps and you know why they're there and you're invested in whether they're going to learn their lesson or not. And if they don't fuck it, they suck anyway. And there was some interesting things done here to continue to build out the relationship between Jigsaw and Amanda and some interesting things done to create this rivalry between Jigsaw and Cecilia and a lot of interesting building blocks to where they put this franchise in a position where it has the most potential and the biggest breath of life that it has had in a very long time at the 10th movie. Just a hell of an achievement. So over time, the more that I have talked about this movie, the more that I have discussed it and rewatched it, I've liked it more, and it has climbed all the way up to my number two of the year. But my number one horror film is actually Talk to Me, and this is a film that a, a lot like Saw X, where I watched it in theaters, and I really liked it. But it wasn't until I watched it again and discussed it more and you know started to dive into it a little bit more that I really started to appreciate it significantly more over time. And it was cool that this thing was made by a bunch of YouTubers. That was kind of the only thing I knew about it when I walked into it. I didn't watch a trailer or really know the plot of it. And what you have here is a, another play on possession movies that's very unique, similar to when Evil Lurks. Where there's this cursed ceramic hand and these kids in Australia get a hold of it. And when you grab the hand, you can have this dead person or this demonic entity possess your body. And when you let go of the hand, they leave. And so they treat it like a party game where they, you know, put TikToks and they film each other getting possessed and they they treat it like this crazy, hilarious situation and things go incredibly wrong. And it was just a really neat, simple concept that was shot and directed and executed very well with characters that I liked, with certain complicated natures of their relationships that I thought was believable, especially in a high school setting. And the, the gore and the, the, the violence and the scary side of things, especially when you start to see kind of beyond that veil of our world into the world of the people possessing everybody was very effectively creepy. And even though there's certain details about the movie that I felt was a little underdeveloped as far, I don't want to talk too specifically about the relationship that the girl has with her mother and then the mother's motivation from beyond the dead and stuff. There were some things in there that I, I didn't quite understand what was being conveyed as far as that that entity's motivations, but that's kind of made me like the movie more on rewatch to where I can get one thing out of it. Somebody else can get something entirely different out of it. And neither one of us are necessarily wrong. And they both kind of end up at the same end point anyway. So it's, it's, it's all about the journey that we kind of interpret. And so I really enjoyed that. And uh, some people have cried foul that they've already greenlit. Talk to me too. I'm actually okay with them doing that because I feel like there's a lot more that they can explore here. And there's some things that I think that they probably had ideas and concepts for that they left out of this because they wanted this to be as tight and as clean and as simple as possible. So while this would succeed just fine as a standalone, I actually think there's a lot of potential to do things with a sequel. So I am looking forward to it. And uh, by the end of the year, when I'm looking at all my experiences, Talk To Me is my number one horror film of 2023. Well, that's it for this one, guys. It was probably a long one, but click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews. If you want more in-depth thoughts, I'm also going to put my top 10 worst films of 2023 for you to check out and make sure you like, share, and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss my top 10 best of the year, as well as my ranking of all of the movies that I saw in 2023. That's gonna be a massive video. And as always, Remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.